Welcome to the Franchise Masters Podcast, where aspiring entrepreneurs learn what it takes to find, buy, and build successful franchise businesses. My name is Drew Carpenito, and I'm your host as we dive into these fascinating behind-the-scenes stories of people who have used surprising franchises to create massive success. I'm glad you're here. Let's dig in. Welcome to the Franchise Masters Podcast. Today, I am joined by the founder of an emerging franchise, it's been around for a while, but it's just starting to hit their stride with national expansion. Kelsey Stewart, founder of Bloom and Blinds. Welcome to the show, my friend. How are you? Thank you, Drew. I feel like I'm going to start off a little slow, like the lullaby of that voice. Like, Oh, yes. Yeah, I turned sounds... my radio voice on. Uh, <laughs> it's yeah. gorgeous. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Kelsey and I have gotten to know each other over the past couple of years as, uh, as they've started to, to grow. Um, well, you've been a national company. You've just kind of kind of push the button on accelerating the expansion um, over the past yeah. year or so. So, and doing a great job. The feedback is, is amazing. So look forward to um, learn a little bit more about Bloomin' and you and how you guys are rolling. But um, we were talking a little bit earlier before, uh, before we went on here, you guys have an interesting story in terms of, you know, been around since the early 2000s, right? And yeah. seen a lot, but what was the genesis of Bloomin' Blinds? And how did you guys get into this whole franchise thing? <laughs> the very beginning was in the mid 90s. So my mom started this whole thing. This is mom's fault. And <laughs> <laughs> it's all mom's fault. Uh, so we're in Washington. So I'm about, I'm in Mount Vernon, Washington, which is like 30 miles from the Canadian border. So we're way up there, right? Mom sees an ad in a newspaper for a blind cleaning machine. And as a natural entrepreneur, she's second generation uh, entrepreneur. She's like, well, I've never heard of that before. Surely I can make some money. So she goes out and buys this blind cleaning machine, thinking she's going to dominate the world cleaning blinds. She puts an ad in the newspaper every Tuesday, and the only phone calls she gets are blind repair. Well, okay. she, bought a blind, she bought a blind cleaning tank. That doesn't do any good. So realizing there's a need, so she starts trying to figure out where to buy stuff. Um, goes to factories. They tell her no, because if you fix a blind, they're not buying one of mine. She begins to go to flea marts or thrift stores or look for blinds on the side of the road. And she starts harvesting parts from old products, like starts pulling them apart just to try and have something to do a repair with. Hmm. Um, and, and somehow manages to get enough stuff for that. Uh, at a one point, this is my favorite story, the whole thing. A factory told her, no, I'm not going to sell you parts. And she said, well, will you tell me who you buy them from? And they're like, no. And so she waits till they close and my mom literally jumps in the dumpster, literally jumps <laughs> in the dumpster <laughs> and starts tearing labels off the boxes, not to be told no. I, I, it runs thick in our family. Yeah. And so my, like mom's like feet up in the air, tearing boxes, trying to get labels. And those are some of the suppliers we still use today. <laughs> I awesome. swear, it's, it is fantastic. So she ran that as a one woman show in Seattle for seven years. And after a divorce, uh, she sold everything, moved to Dallas uh, just for something new. Uh, and ironically, the business she sold is still open. So we're 22 years down the road. That's still rolling. Wow. Um, yeah. And so got to Dallas and that's where Bloom and Blinds was born. And our day of incorporation was 9-11, like the morning of 9-11. We submitted our paperwork. Then the towers got hit. We're one of the last pieces of paperwork that Washington State did that day. Wow. Um, and so it's so it's really easy to remember what our birthday is. Wow! Uh, and from from there, we just grew a family business. Um, you know, she started off the intention of being a one woman show. Uh, very quickly, the boys and I jumped in, and over the course of the next seventeen years, uh, we built a three million dollar a year family business. And and it was cool. Like we we were having fun, and you know, we were masters of our own domain. We were quietly one of the largest blind companies in Dallas, and we knew we had something special. And I, in particular, knew that I didn't want to be an owner-operator. My parents have always been an owner-operator. I grew up in an entrepreneurial family, but always on owner-operator. And so I knew that we had to build an empire, or I was going to be at their cash register for the rest of my life, unless I okay. did something different. Um, and so it was, it was okay, Do we? how do we grow? How do we expand? How do we scale this thing? Do we do company stores? Well, in our mind, that meant you took the family and you sent one to Kansas City, you sent one to Houston, you sent one to Orlando, like whatever, whatever city was. But it meant breaking up the family. Yeah. And we we enjoy and have gotten really good at working as a family. I still work with my brothers every day. Um, or it was franchising. And the biggest challenge in franchising is that emotional control. 
letting go of what what people do with your name, your logo, the business concept, and when you're not watching. And it, it's really just an extension of employees, though. You know, it, but even that's an emotional hurdle. Um, but franchising was the right choice for us because it kept the family together. And so in 2014, formed the Franchise Corporation. 2015, in March, opened up the first one. And since then, we've been opening, on average, one location a month, basically since then. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So you guys kind of hit the ground running a little bit because sometimes it, the whole acquiring franchise, like finding the right people to partner with to open franchises can take, can be its own little yeah. <laughs> obstacle to get over and kind of navigate through to figure out. It did. It, it it took six months of marketing before we, that first franchise owner, because, you know, those early adopters, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't say this, but like they're your guinea pigs. Like they're, they're the ones who are willing to try out something that's not brand new. The challenge there is they also are not system followers like they're early adopters they're entrepreneurial in their own right and amazingly most of them are still open uh, virtually all of them and i say that's amazing because at that point we thought running a franchise just simply meant giving them a little bit of an idea of what we do and then wishing them good luck and so i look back on who we are as a franchise or now versus where who we were when we first got this thing started like i i can't believe they're still in business like we did really? such a bad job. We did, but there was, there was no support. <laughs> My idea of training was to throw them in a van for three weeks and ride around. And and that was, there's your training. Good luck. Huh. So what changed? Like what was, what, what happened? Like what, what was the moment that you guys looked back and said, Hey, we, we need to refine some stuff and, or wh whatever. What was that like? What switched was we're 24, we have 24 franchise owners and I've got this new shiny toy that we want to play with. And at that point, I'm single-handedly building the franchise business and selling blinds in living rooms to the tune of three million a year. Like that's a, I mean, it was a big full day. I would start at seven and I would end at about one o'clock in the morning. Wow. Daily for a year and a half. And so we knew that we needed to focus on the franchise. So I went to the family and said, Hey, look, I'm pulling myself out of Bloom and Blinds, the Dallas office. And then of course the other two brothers were like, well, then I am too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay good i build it and then you guys show up appreciate it <laughs> okay so and that's fine but what what so within our family dynamic like i'm the dreamer i'm the entrepreneur i'm the the, the head and clouds kind of guy i'm the visionary if you want to use that term and the other two are exceptional operators and so at that moment, all of a sudden they interjected into the business and they started to build systems and processes and plug holes in the gaps that I didn't naturally see because I'm the visionary. I don't see these things, right? All I do is look forward. I don't realize what happened behind me. Um, and so with their engagement and with their involvement and now a more robust team, now we begin to infuse support structure and, and infrastructure into the business that would have never occurred to me. Me, hmm. I'm just like, let's go get more people to play with. And that's all that mattered to me. But those two have a different viewpoint in our world. And and we call it kind of a spherical approach. Like since that day when they jumped in with us, our, we have three desks. They touch in, on the corners. Like we run this company as a triangle, literally. And, and today it's still the same. So all three of us are naturally different. And I think that's because we grew up together. We had to kind of fill different spaces of a room otherwise we would overlap and kill each other like that's how we <laughs> <laughs> like that's how we've been able to do this for almost 20 years shoulder to shoulder is we're different people and that's okay and we can respect that we don't always have to be right because when we look at a problem or a challenge i have my viewpoint the other two have their unique viewpoints and when we put them together then we have a really clear picture of different pros and cons that we wouldn't naturally see yeah it's been an amazing tool for us i bet it sounds like you guys are really aware of the dynamic that exists amongst yourselves and the different perspectives that each one brings to the table. And, and if, you've got, if you can embrace that, it, it can be powerful. It wasn't purposeful, but it was what kept us together. And we began to realize the strength that it gave us. So then we began to lean into it and really focus on, you know, stretching out its abilities. Yeah, I'm jealous. I don't think my, I've always wondered how my brother and I would, uh, would 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 interact if we were in a business together we're exactly we're, we're kind of opposites and uh oh man yeah you know i have so a lot of great, patience with a lot of people i don't have a lot of patience with him <laughs> for whatever uh, great here's a great story from the past so you know back in the day we used to do blind cleaning now 
our business currently, we focus primarily sales, install, and repair. One of the things that will carry us or we may morph into strongly if we hit a major recession is that maintenance side of blind cleaning. But that's part of our roots. That's how we grew up, right? Mom bought a blind cleaning tank first. So we're at, you know, we live in Texas. We're in the middle of the summer. We're outside cleaning blinds in a metal U-Haul truck, for lack of a better word. And it's hot. We're pissy. We're grumpy. And because we're still young and we hadn't figured out the pecking order, we're constantly tearing each other down. (laughs) Constantly. (laughs) But, you know, but we also came before this, we all grew up in the service industry. So we're all bartenders or waiters or cooks. And so there's also this performance element. There's the showman. And so like I am verbally destroying him and he is verbally destroying me (laughs) out in the truck. But the moment we go back into the house, it's, Hey buddy, can you hand me that? Sure, pal, you (laughs) bet. (laughs) And then we walk out the door and I give him the dirty look and he gives me the dirty look and we flip each other off and we go off and we go to the next (laughs) one. That's how you make a, that's how you make a family business work. You can't (laughs) pretend that stuff's not going to happen. You just can't show it to your customers. Oh, I love it. So are you the oldest? Yeah. Yeah. I got, I got, okay. So So you got, you got me (laughs) and then a year and a half later, you got Chris and then four years after that, you got Kevin. And so we're, we're all within six years. Nice. Nice. (laughs) That's awesome. Uh, you know, there's a lot of wisdom and a lot of nuggets in that for anybody who's thinking about <laughs> opening a business with family members, including your wife or your spouse oh, or your husband yeah. and you know the whole nine yards, right? Like it's, uh, it can be a little, um, you know, a new dynamic into the, into your life, but, um, that's funny. So when you guys were like, when you guys were refining the, the blue and blind system, you know, working together to, with your brothers to kind of put in some more su- support and systems were, how did the OG franchisees that, that opened, without the systems that you guys were creating at the time, how did, how did they respond to some of the new stuff that you were putting in place? Well, one of the things that we did in the very beginning was uh, create requirements that we all stay on the same platforms, the same systems, the same, like I saw from other franchises that had scattered processes or scattered software or POS systems. Um, So from the very beginning, that was within our our mandates was we're all going to ride on the same platforms. So from a from a software or website or marketing, like that was a requirement. And so generally they were kind of born with that expectation. So as we grew, they kind of grew into it and I didn't get much pushback. Now, the mentality and the methodology in which we do things, the technology that we've infused into the company, which is pretty significant, partial adoption is, is a kind way to put it. Um, yeah. Even though it's, you know, we've proven out that it makes more money, it makes your life easier, but once you get into a rhythm, you know, if you're a 54 year old dude and you've been doing it the same way for two years and you feel like it's working and all of a sudden I come up with some widget that I want you to play with, you know, there's enough personalization or enough room for personalization in this business. You know, the ones that like systems and processes adopt it because they see the wisdom in it. And the ones that are a bit more entrepreneurial in their own, in their own mind, you know, tend to evaluate it and pick and choose which parts they want. Yeah. We leave, we leave room for that because these aren't, critical elements the ones that are critical whether it be the branding or the website or the marketing company or the software like those are critical elements and those are mandated through the fdd for everyone's benefit um, but we wanted to leave a lot of room for people to personalize the business and be able to find that space where it fits their groove yeah yeah there's a lot of wisdom in that especially when there's legacy you know original franchise owners that you know they're happy they're profitable they're good they're operating good enough you know, within the standards, you know, the critical stuff and, you know, that, that last, you know, those last few things can, can always be a little bit of a, you know, judgment call on uh, yeah. how hard you want to push. Yeah. The, what we've learned is in, you know, so as a philosophy, I don't think anyone's coachable until they ask for coaching, right? If I try and, you know, like nobody wants your opinion until they ask for it. And so we've made everything available. We've offered to coach, we've offered to, to, circle back around and spend special time. Like if you're willing to listen, I'm willing to spend the time with you. Um, What's pulling them in now, the legacies, is that the new owners are coming out faster, pushing bigger numbers. They're Mm. they're finding more success. And so the ones that aren't quite content yet are now kind of poking their head up and saying, what are you guys doing? (laughs) And, And we're, you know, there's no attitude about it. Like if you're willing, like let's do this but I need you coachable or I have other things to spend my time on. And we're really honest and fair and transparent about that. 
Like if yeah. you're willing to adopt the recipe, then I'll take my personal time and help you get there. But if you're going to go back to picking and choosing what you want to do, I, I have other people who are going to do, you know, the recipe. But we've always been really transparent about it. Like you have freedom, but if you want my help, you have to do it 100%. Yeah, I I respect the way that you go about it and conduct yourself. Kelsey, just, you know, we we as consultants on this side, like we get we get a lot of information thrown at us and a lot of it's um <laughs> we're yes. pretty good at we're pretty good at like our our BS meters pretty good just cuz we've all been doing this for so long. We've we've kind of heard and seen and done it all type of thing, but like the way that you conduct yourself all the times that we've hung out and met and, and you had an opportunity to, you know, have some mind share in front of the consultants. Like you, you are just real and you just, you just put it out there and call it like it is. And, and that is, it's refreshingly transparent to see, but it's also cool to hear how, how you, that's how you roll with, within the company and, and, and interacting with the franchise owners. And it's part of your culture in terms of keeping it real, keeping it raw. Like, Hey, we're here to make some money and build businesses and build a brand and build a family. But you know, we're not going to, we're not going to sit here and blow smoke up, up, uh, up your butt. You know, it's, it's a business. And uh, yeah. So because you know, like the whole thing is led by family, you know, started with mom. Now it's three brothers running the whole thing. And and you have that transparency inside your house. Like at Thanksgiving dinner, you generally get to be that transparent. And, you know, like we don't know how in any other way to act. I'm, I work with my brothers every day. And so we do conduct ourselves with that family ethos that, like I'm, if I can't act like this is my family, then I have the wrong people in the room and I'm in the fortunate position where I get to pick the people in the room. So it's, yeah, it, that transparency does get woven through everything we do. You have to be polite. You have to watch, you know, the impact of your words, but it doesn't mean you can't be honest or transparent in the process. And yeah. everyone has, everyone who's come on board has gotten to know us that that's like, I'll, I may, you may not always like what I say, but you know, I always mean it. Yeah. Well, I guess like, and, and franchise owners have a unique perspective into, into your life personally, because you're, your family and uh, you know, yeah. that, that's typically how you can, you can get some pretty good insight into people's character, right? Is, is uh, what the family dynamic is like as you guys are continuing to grow and bringing on more and more franchise owners. What are some of the things that you look for in the folks that you want to partner with who want to open up a bloom and blinds? That's been an evolution. So we've, we've actually gone through, because for those who don't know me on this podcast, like I'm a blind guy that started a franchise, right? I, I don't have an MBA. I don't have 20 years in franchising and mentors who have taught me what to do. We had to figure this out from the beginning. And so in the very beginning, we brought in franchise owners who look just like us, pure entrepreneurs, people who will take a square hole and push on the sides until it turns on a circle. Like that's, that's who we are as entrepreneurs. Um, and we realized that that came with advantages and challenges in a franchise, which is system-based, probably more challenges, a lot of great people, but challenges. Um, and then we didn't know who we had and so, or who we wanted. So the second stage and, and some of our earlier rapid expansion, we let everybody in. If you had a pulse and an interest, come on in. And we found some incredible candidates and we found some others. And Unfortunately, not every franchise makes it. The bulk of the ones that we've had close are from this group because they, we let in people who we weren't discerning. We didn't know how to be discerning. This was our attempt to learn, uh, but underfunded, undermotivated, you know, they didn't have that work ethic and, or stumbled upon, fat, stumbled upon fantastic franchise operators. And so through that second group, we began to identify, okay, who are these ones that really show us how to uh, like they're crying for the support and the attention and the training that we need to develop. And so by listening to those franchise owners, that kind of helped guide us on how to build as a company, but it also helped identify who is, who is that candidate that we're looking for and the personality and the mindset. And so now we're kind of in that third evolution where now I have the benefit of all that past knowledge. And now I'm looking for someone who's mildly ambitious. Well, no, somebody who's ambitious, but mildly entrepreneur. You, you have to be willing to blaze through challenges with fortitude and grit as an entrepreneur should if you're going to run a business. I don't care if it's this business or an ice cream shop. You're still going to need it. Yeah. And we're looking we're looking for someone who likes systems and processes. Someone who looks at a, an established system and an infrastructure of support as like shoulders they can stand on to get above the crowd. 
where an entrepreneur looks at them as a limiter of their personal freedom. I would be the world's worst franchisee. Why is that? It doesn't matter how because it doesn't matter how big your system is, how good it is. I naturally assume that I can find ways to make it better, which keeps me from following it to a T. I'm right. constantly going to tinker with it. Um, and that arrogance helps me in business, but it's terrible in a franchise business. So as a Zor, I'm in the right seat. I am right where I should be because I, I get to sit here and create things for other people to use. Now that we're beginning to see that candidate, um, now we're actually into almost a fourth stage. We're, in, we're kind of entering into a fourth stage where now I'm looking for an overly ambitious person with that same personality type because now we've gone from owner operators so now we're bringing in people who want scalable businesses they have higher aspirations still love my owner operators i got a confirmation day next week i got three owner operators coming in got no problem with that love that's my core that's those are my people but i i can also represent realize from my own experience that there's a glass ceiling that comes with being an owner operator not only physically but mentally and sometimes financially and so I know that this business can do more if we have more vans on the road. So if I have an owner who wants a couple of territories, wants to put three or four vans on the road within a couple of years, I know that Bloom and Blinds is growing bigger and stronger because of that candidate and that ambition and ability and mindset. So we found the right people. Now I'm, I'm willing to take the, the one-man show and the scalable solution, but it's still the same mentality, still this kind of the same person at the core. Yeah. And and it is the like with that fourth evolution of you know somebody who's going to come in and grow to multiple vans fairly quickly is and you you feel like with the systems and 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 all the work that you guys have been doing on the internal aspects of you know evolving as a franchise company you feel like that those are the systems that give those folks that want to scale the ability to scale. I mean, the day to day activity is the same whether you're a, a one van or three vans. Like it, you go out to the customer. You help them however need be. You politely extract as much money as possible. And then you move on to the next one, right? Like it's rinse and repeat. <laughs> they invited us over. It's their idea. It's not my fault. Uh, I love it. Right? Yeah, yeah you like I, that transparency? I, I, That's I, how we roll, baby. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> so, so the difference in somebody who's got three vans is the support. So I, we kind of have like two layers of support. I have the technician support. So when someone's out in a van, we've got all kinds of staff that can take their calls, help them on site in the middle of a project so they don't stall out and they don't have to leave without that extraction. Um, but then we also have the managerial support. And that could be a general manager or it could be the actual owner who's acting as the general manager. And we've actually just developed a two-year sequence and it's founder-led. So the first year that they launch, they're working with my youngest brother, Kevin, and he's literally on weekly touch points where he's watching their KPIs. We just uploaded this new um, this new software that we're in love with called Fran Metrics. Maybe you can get him to sponsor the show. Uh, <laughs> but it's it's a it's basically taking your PL and flipping it into a dashboard. Okay. And and so we sent benchmark benchmarks on probably 15 different KPIs. And some of them are ratio driven and some are true, true financial. But the franchise owner tells us, what's your end goal? Okay, on an annual level, I want to do X amount of dollars this year. And so we know the percentage of the revenue that are traditional, certainly within that first 12 months. So in your third month, the average of your annual revenue is this much. So how are you on track for that? But because it's on a dashboard, we can see the whole thing. And, mm -hmm. and it's mutual, right? Like we all, so we, we coach to this dashboard because we set the benchmarks, we can see where they're at. And then the franchisee gets a little bit of a competitive juice because on each one of those matrix, they can see where they rank within the company. Are you the fourth most profitable company or are you the 34th most profitable company? And it's not going to tell you who's above and below, but it's going to tell you where you sit. And so they go through a year of that with Kevin and that's weekly coaching. That way we don't lose track. Like they, we want to launch them the right way. And then second year they move in with me and so now we're more of on like a monthly status, but now we're in the scale approach. We've got the thing going, you're rolling, you've got it something, you know, your team settled and established. Now, how far do you want to push this? And that's really my gift is that scalable, you know, big picture, you know, don't be scared of anything. Let's go get it kind of mentality. And that's where I take over and start helping them 
you know, get beyond that first year and not get stuck there. It's so, pretty powerful stuff. It, it's a huge evolution for us. It just, like we literally just launched it like three months ago. Wow. Yeah. Cause it's, you know, I think whenever you're starting a new business and you have, you know, a new franchise owner has these grand, this grand vision and these grand plans for where they want to get to, which is great. It's okay. Now, how do you get there? And it's not month one, it's not month three, it's not month six, right? Like there's, there's the gradual build that has to happen. And by, by, I would imagine by helping the franchise owners understand, take the, take their, their long-term plan and kind of chunk it down into manageable timeframes, like, every month or every 90 days and then to, to be able to benchmark yeah, where they are right, right, against right, right, right. moving towards that long-term goal can help them, you know, find, find some sanity in the delayed gratification that, you know, folks typically have to go through in order to, you know, reap the, reap the positive rewards that can come long-term, but that's, that's pretty powerful stuff. Um, that's cool. I it, didn't know that. It's a really exciting program. I think that, yeah, well, again, it, it just launched. Um, yeah. Yeah. Have- even even if there is a problem, the fact that we're doing this coaching, you're not going to be surprised by it. It's not going to come up and bite you when you didn't know what even happened. Like if you have a problem, at least you're aware and you could begin to address it early on and fight against it. Even if you never really solve it, at least you were aware and you were able to put effort towards it. And uh, from a revenue standpoint, from a satisfaction for the franchise owner, like they're learning how to run a business in real time but it's with active coaching hmm. versus the, the school of hard knocks. Yeah. Which is how most do it. Yeah. So w- as you guys have developed this coaching program that helps franchise owners scale through a path, like where, what inspired you guys to put this, put this coaching program together? Were there things that you pulled from books or people or other <laughs> franchise companies? You guys, you guys just look back at your own journey and say, Hey, this is, this is, this is what it needs to be. No, so we we hired a franchise coach, like somebody from the franchising space. Going to give out a shout out to Jerry Henley from Launch to Grow. So he's our franchise coach, um, and he's an operations guy. And he's kind of he's got this business model. It's very similar to an EOS system, but he's also very familiar with the franchise business coach role, which is what franchisors end up building. That's kind of this this coaching model that I'm talking about. And uh, you know, more established brands tend to have it. We've we saw that we needed it to keep these. So we, we added it a bit early in the natural franchise or growth stage. Okay. Um, so, so he brought it to us and he said, look, you guys are doing great, but they turn into how they launch. Like you, if you don't launch them well, they'll never really grow into their potential. And so um, it sounded like it made sense. We knew it was a service to our franchisees that is valuable. You know, it doesn't cost anything. It's just our time. And we ran right towards it. We said, yeah, if, if this helps this franchise owner be better, more successful, more profitable, that's really the definition of a good franchise is do you have owners who are making money and are happy? Right. So it, we, there's no reason to turn it away. And so, yeah, it wasn't us, uh, but we, we do love mentors as much as we like to be a mentor for our franchisees. We also love mentors. And so this was a, a great opportunity from one of our mentors. Yeah, but it kind of it was you guys to like even just recognize that hey, there's an opportunity here. We may not have the answers internally, but let's go figure out where to who the best resource or what the best resource is going to be to help us put this thing together that we know can help the franchise owners be make more money and be happier and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and it, you know, like I said, we're a bit early in the normal progression for a franchise. Like normally, it's not founders leading this; it's usually hired business coaches. And we'll get there as we continue to grow the program. We're going to get to a point where people are skilled at doing this. You know, maybe have done it for other companies or we train them how, but in the long run, you know, we get up to 200 locations. We're probably going to have four to six, maybe more of these business coaches who do nothing but connect and, and breathe life into franchise owners every day. Hmm. Like, so we know it's part of our long-term plan. So why not get it going early? Yeah. And the fact that you guys are doing it helps you know it better and can manage it better and find the right people to, to fit that role, you know, fill in that role. And, and uh, yeah, it's, it's our opportunity to learn it before we start hiring for it or coaching it and teaching it. Yeah. I and which is that. weird. Yeah. yeah. We we're very much a, I can't, I can't possibly tell you to do something that I wouldn't do or don't know how to do myself. So um, that's what we did. Interesting. 
kind of going back when we were talking offline a little bit earlier, you said something that has stuck in my mind and I, I can't, I can't not forget it. Um, you, you, oh, you, God, you've which coined, one? yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the, appropriate, the appropriate one that we'll talk about. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, the, um, you know, the idea of this momentary ambition as it relates yeah. to the franchise owners and, and bringing on the right folks. So, um, how like so with moment momentary ambition can you explain that a little bit more for everybody who's listening and and maybe talk a little bit about how you how you use whatever you use to assess the franchise owners to figure out if they're the right fit mm -hmm. so and this is like any any candidate or anyone who's interested in franchising really like hone in on this one because this is an important piece and this is an emotional journey that most don't even recognize it's happening six months before you started considering an opening business you are who you are Right? You have ambition levels, you have work ethic, you have a natural drive. That is who you are if you're an adult. You're probably set in that way. But then you get this idea that you want to start a business, whether it be out of fear or pain or opportunity. But you get this idea, and it's a seed, and it starts to slowly grow. It's a swell that picks up momentum. And so as you start learning about different businesses, you start talking to consultants and, and coaches like Drew, you start getting motivated, and you start getting this inflated or exaggerated swell of ambition and by the time we as a franchise meet you you are months into this process and you have put in a lot of time and a lot of dreams and a lot of wondering and conquering fears just to get this far and so we've we've coined this term momentary ambition and that's the point in which we meet somebody because now you are kind of all hyped up and you're starting to feel like, you know, okay, I could do this. Like, this might be real. Like, okay, I think I'm getting my financing in place. I'm starting to daydream. For us, I'm starting to watch vans drive by and wonder what it would be like to have a Bloom and Blinds van. And what we've come to realize is that for some candidates, that's who they truly are, that inflated moment where we meet them. But some candidates, it's, it's truly an inflation. It's a hyper version of who they really are when the dust settles. And so sometimes we see candidates come off that swell they bought you know they've, they've been awarded the franchise they've moved forward with funding they've gone through training and now that now the rubber meets the road at the home and now they go back to who they really were not that that's a negative it's just understand that there's this ebb and flow within this process and and then it becomes more difficult to run a business because you're not really that person that that you showed us and not not by deception just natural evolution and so we've come to realize for our protection and for the candidates protection that we have to watch out for this. We have to re recognize or try and evaluate, is this who this person is, or is this a, a momentary ambition? And what we've, there's not really a good test for it. Now we do use personality profiles and things like that. And we find those very helpful, but really we begin to try and talk to the candidate or talk to the, the prospective franchise owner. And we're looking for achiever signs what have you done in your life that is exceptional or out of the box in, in it that took a lot of effort? And it could be something as simple as I took a six week walk through the woods on a backpacking trip. Like that takes a lot of planning, a lot of preparation. It takes a lot of grit and endurance to make it through. Could be I ran a marathon, right? You have to train for months before that one moment. Could be I climbed the corporate ladder. Like that is a thing, especially if you do it at an exceptionally high level. Uh, recently had a candidate who worked in a bar, then got to a point where he bought the bar from the owner, liked it so much, he went and found investors, and he and the investors opened four more bars, and then they all sold them, right? So like that, those are things that aren't just the humdrum of, oh, I go to work, and I come home, and I eat, and I go to bed. Like that's that's probably not a lifestyle that's going to fit owning a business really well like that's a not a natural fit but if somebody has something in their past where we can understand that they have that fortitude to push through a long sequence delayed gratitude is kind of a good word for franchising and or uh delayed gratitude sure we'll roll with that yeah gratification yeah gratification. gratification yeah that's what i was looking for so if, if you can if we can see where that happened before then i can i can believe that you'll have the thing that it takes to run a business in the future. And so that realization was key for us because we occasionally were surprised, like what happened? Like where'd it go? 
And that's what kind of helped us understand that, oh, okay, there's this swell. We got to watch out for that. We got to help them watch out for it. So we, we actually talk in our transparent nature. We actually talk to candidates about this. We're trying to be vocal so that maybe they can recognize it and save themselves some trouble if that's, if that's really what's going on. Hmm. Um, but it, I don't find that this is talked about in franchising very much. And so I, um, often I, you know, ears are perked and people are like, huh, what? But it, it, I think it's a real thing. Yeah. No, I've never, I've never heard it phrased and, and kind of captured in the essence that you did, but yeah, no, it, it is a, you have um, identified something that is very real as folks go through the the journey of having that itch, the itch becomes bigger. They start looking at businesses, but you know, it's always the chicken and the egg. It's like, you know, we're, we're somewhat limited in terms of like how much information we can really give people and it's their journey and their process. Um, but um, yeah, no, I've seen it too. When I was on the franchise or side, you know, folks that, that kind of get, get, get caught up in the hype and the emotion and, you know, little things that I've seen on the consultant side is like how they do their research can, can be a little bit of a predictor in terms of, I think how they might operate the business, you know, the folks that like really spend the time digging in and looking under the rocks and stuff like that. Um, but, um, but yeah, no, it's a, it, it, it is a very real thing. So do you have any examples of any folks that you feel were in a momentary ambition and weren't right for the business at that, at that time in their life? It's happened. Um, you know, I, I can't use names or cities, right. That would give it away. Yeah, I, I mean, even recently, probably in the last four four to six months, you know, I can think of at least one owner who had everything we were looking for. The show was great. Um, and we get them home and they're like just scared of everything. And I didn't see any of that going through validation process, getting to know them through those calls, you know, the confirmation day, spending two days with them, you know, fun, loving, loose, free. And then the pressure of the business, you know, you've got so many choices to make that you almost get paralyzed because it's like that. Uh, it's a similar to the uh, analysis paralysis. But new owners, when they go home, they're out of the nest, right? Like Mama Bird kicked them out and now they've got to figure out how to fly. And we're here to help you, but I can't flap your wings for you. Like that's not right. what franchising is. And and even now, like we're working hard. Like I heard Kevin on a coaching call the other day and it was just one excuse after another about why they couldn't do what we were trying to help them do, what works nationwide. And it, it's all fear. And so we're trying to massage them and encourage them and, and help them work through it. But the business is struggling because when, when the rubber hit the road, they, they, a different element, I don't even know if it was who they were before, but something else happened. Yeah. And at the same time, though, I'll give you the alternative. I've had tons of franchise candidates who I come in and I'm like, man, like, I like the guy, but I'm not sure. And they, they go home and they have that fear and then they muscle through it and then they get used to it and then they become bohemists, like giants in the forest, just knocking trees down. Um, I've had one, this, this guy I'm thinking of, like the first three months, like I swear he almost gave himself a heart attack just out of panic and being so, he was so wound up from the corporate world. It took him months to unwind. And now he's like number two or three in the company every month. Wow. <laughs> and and it, it, so there's this, you know, you, you never quite know how people are going to react when when the weight of a new business shows up and all those question marks are sitting on your shoulders. And what we try and encourage everybody is like, look, if you can just keep moving forward, just if you believe me enough to get here, I haven't failed you yet. You know, I've never lied to you. Like, let me help you walk down this path. And if you just let me and you just trust it, the repetition and the time will make this better. If, if you still believe in me, please keep moving forward because it, it's like a shark. If you're not swimming, you're not breathing. Yeah. It's just do something. Do just do, yeah. and you do one thing and something is going to, something good's going to happen. And then you can, you mastered that one thing. And next, now you can do something else and you get momentum, you get confidence and it just snowballs, but you got to just do, you know, within the guidelines, yeah. right. But pick something and just do make yeah. it, take action, get momentum going. 
Don't sit yeah, behind your computer every day. You know, and, at LinkedIn. and guys like you and I, yeah, guys like you and I that have been business for ourselves for a while, like we look at it and I catch myself doing this. Sometimes I approach this almost too casually because for me, second nature now, done it for a long time. I've ridden this road for a while. We've had our ups and downs, but now no big deal. But those new owners, like that's, it's brand new. Like that's, that's fresh, tender skin you're touching and they haven't built up the calluses. And so we have to be very careful about how cavalier we are about it'll be fine. You still have to be empathetic to how they felt, despite the fact that I forgot what it was like to start a business. It's yeah. been that long ago. Yeah, so you're as much these of are a all great. psychologist as a as an entrepreneur and a business coach, right? Sometimes. Yeah. At, well, when you go into franchising, if you're not ready to be a counselor, yeah, you're in the wrong business, buddy. Yeah, well said. And you, do you guys still operate your Dallas operation? The Dallas one got sold as a franchise unit. So okay. that was 2018. But okay. um, grow, wanting to grow into this, this this kind of fourth evolution, the people with the higher uh, desires, they wanted more vans on the road. Um, we had an opportunity to start up a, a full semi or full absentee. I wouldn't even call it a semi absentee. Like it's to the outermost extreme uh, in Austin, three and a half hours south of us. And so totally remote from us. You know, I can't, I can't just get there in 10 minutes. Hired a general manager, made sure I picked a good growth-minded team-building general manager, gave him a gave him a budget to work with, um, hired three technicians, funded it well. Uh, it's the equivalent of five territories, so it's a it's a it's a big operation, um, and and pushed a ton of volume, uh, the fastest launch of a business ever. Hmm. And we did we did that before we brought on this fourth generation, kind of like the coaching where we want to do it before I teach it. I had to prove it out to myself. I couldn't, I couldn't handle the conscience of taking somebody's money if I didn't honestly know that it could be done. And so we we proved it out for about a year and a half, and then began to introduce it to franchise owners. So that's the only corporate, it's the only corporate office we have right now is that Austin, Texas. But it's, I mean, like literally, we touch it five hours a week, or no, a month. Wow. If you're going to run any business that's controlled by a GM the business success is really predicated on the quality and the skill set of that general manager. Right. Right. At this point, I'm, I'm basically an an investor, if you will. We made sure we picked and incentivized a really good manager to do the work. Right. You know, we gave him a good base, but then we gave him his bonus or his extra money off the profitability of the business, not gross sales, but the profitability. And it's kept the motivation in line. It's kept the growth coming. And uh, it is, uh, it's only, it's almost two years old and it is in the top two or three in terms of revenue every month. Wow. And it, it's it. growing. It'll be, it'll be number one pretty soon, but it's Austin, Texas. So that's kind of cheating. Like it's a great market to build a business. Yeah. Well, Hey, you're the franchisor. You get to cherry pick. It's all good. Um. <laughs> well, it's close <laughs> enough. It was the, it was the only big market that I had that was close enough that I could drive down there to triage if I needed to. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's great that you guys, again, you, you stepped up, you did it, you learned it, you you went through it, you made the investment and and you guys are learners. I mean, you're paying, it It sounds like you pay attention to everything and then are able to, you know, now you have the, the way to kind of capture the learnings and the feedback and systematize it and then roll it out to the new franchise owners or existing franchise owners if, um, you know, if the existing ones want to adopt it. So that's awesome. So what's next for you in Bloomin? Uh, we, we all started launching a podcast every month. What's going to roll into two months. We do what we call a family meeting company wide zoom call. Right. And, you know, usually we bring on some sort of topic or a new vendor something that we're adding to the business. And so we want to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to learn about it firsthand. Um, but never wanted to just leave it alone. Um, we're going to roll it into more of like an internal podcast that we'll also put on YouTube just for the fun of it. But, uh, I'm really excited because the, the intro is going to be like a three to five minute short skit of some of our adventures from the past. Nice. Like I guarantee I'm going to dress somebody up in an old lady's outfit and have her feet sticking out of the dumpster. Like that's <laughs> going to be a thing. <laughs> you I can this, do the do the skit with your brother, you know, as you guys are fighting in the, in the car and then yeah. turn it on when you walk into the customer's house. <laughs> totally. The one, the one that I've wanted forever is this cheesy like this cheesy announcer, like some seventies guy selling TVs, right. And big old mustache or something. 
And I want him out in the front of the camera talking about, have you ever had dog damage on your blinds? Well, we can fix it. And I want my brother, my youngest brother, in a full body dog suit with a baseball bat, just beating the <laughs> hell out of some blinds. <laughs> you know, these are the things that you, you leave you're me alone too long. You're a visionary. This, this is what you really do with your time, Kelsey. We get it. We yeah. get it. <laughs> yeah. That's why I get the big bucks. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. I love, I love uh, it. No. So the, the biggest evolution in the business, we have one franchise owner who's really figured out how to monetize social media. Um, so this guy is pulling, I don't, can I tell numbers on here? Am I allowed to do this? Not really. Okay. Round, roundish, you know, ballpark. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So he's in the seven figures in his third year in business. Okay. And so I guess I'll leave the city out of it too, then. but it's not a major metro area. It's a mid-sized market. And, and he's doing it with a very minimal ad spend because he has created an absolute behemoth of a social media account. Right now we're in the middle of like a three-part um, workshop series with the franchise owners, teaching them the skill set. Like he's giving this to us. I love his heart. He's so happy to give it and teach it because we're all better, stronger together. Mm -hmm. um, but coming to realize what he's doing, we're going to hire an internal social media manager through the National Brand Fund so that this isn't going to cost franchisees anything. And we're creating an influencer program. So one of the big problems, probably shouldn't say this on air when it's going to like, like competitors watch this, but one of the biggest problems for window coverings or any home service mm -hmm. is from a corporate level, if I want to do social media for the brand, I don't have real content. I can't get into the houses. I don't go, right? So I have to take Shutterstock images or I have to take generic stuff and it's watered down and nobody wants to look at that when they're scrolling. It won't catch anyone's eye. Mm -hmm. So we're built, we're building an influencer program, or I'm calling it an influencer program. Franchise owners will be asked to take raw photos, raw videos, don't tune them up, don't deal with the filtering or any of that stuff, send them to us. Our social media manager will tune them up, cut them, clip them, and then we're going to repost them locally with all the appropriate tags and identifiers per city. Like we're just going to sit here and bang them out for every franchise owner because we're like 95% dudes okay. and that's not our native language. Yeah. So if I, if I encourage franchise owners to become social media bohemians and grow their business through it, it ain't going to happen. Yeah. Are you going to put a little Kelsey spin on some of these things to add a little oh, yeah. cheekiness yeah, that, to them? That, yeah. Okay. yeah that, <laughs> that, that, that media manager reports directly to me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah. We are, we are, we're an honorary little brand. I fully believe you can have fun and make money at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I love it. I, I make no apologies for it. Yeah. And that's gotta be, you know, that's probably in the fiber of the folks that you want to partner with as franchise owners too. Like, Hey, it's, it's okay to have fun yeah. and make money and, you know, not take life as seriously as, you know, some other folks do, but you know, if you want to take life as seriously as that, then, you know, just buckle in for the culture that you're signing up for. <laughs> <laughs> so, we yeah. might offend you. Yeah. You might get a little offended by a, a thing or two, but we don't mean it. It's not yep. intentional. Yep. Will they fit in the room is definitely part of our evaluation process. Yeah. 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 Well, good stuff, man. Well, I appreciate you coming on and sharing um, more about your journey and it's your story and, and all the good things that you guys are doing. I, uh, I love to see it. I love, I love the way that you guys have grown, you know, organically getting a good foundation of franchisees out there, learning from it, putting the systems in place and then realizing, Hey, we've, we've got the foundation in, pl in place to go. And, uh, and there's no doubt that you guys are going to get to where you want to get to. So if, uh, if folks want to get in touch with you, where, um, how can they do that? Franchising is a big topic. Picking a new chapter for your life is a big topic. And you know, there's lots of information out there. The tour guide effect of a franchise consultant, like what you do is invaluable. It's free for them, right? Like I, you know, we pay the bill, but they have somebody who can get to know them understand the brands that are available and out there and help cut that learning curve and almost help ensure a better fit. It's like having a tailor build a suit instead of just buying one off the rack. And so, uh, yeah, people can find us directly through our website, but honestly, the best way to do it, if somebody's going to protect themselves and have the best chance of success is I think they come back to you or other consultants that they may know. And I think honestly, that's like your, your best chance of success is making sure you have a qualified tour guide to help you through it. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. 
was a non-paid mm-hmm. endorsement, by the way. Um, thank you. It was. <laughs> oh, uh, no, it's good stuff. I uh, no, I appreciate you coming on, being raw and real, and you know, just I love how you just you know you, you tell it like it is in a very you know insightful way for a lot of folks that are that are out there, and um, and uh, you guys are building something special. So, thank you. Thanks, man. All right, well, like, I'll let you get back. I'll let you get back to uh, you know your social media. You know, the, Bu- the, the building trips. my set. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Talk to you later. All right. Thanks, Drew. That's a wrap. Hope you found a nugget or two in there that can help you on your franchise journey. And if you ever want to talk franchising, reach out to me anytime. 